My uh, contribution to this, this discussion is going to deal with uh, the role of China in Africa, and uh, it is entitled uh, Political Implications of Burgeoning Africa-China Relations, subtitled U.S. Imperialist Militarism on the Continent uh, Seeks to Maintain Dominance over growing efforts aimed at genuine independence. Now, there's been a considerable amount of discussion and debate over the growing uh, economic and political relations between the People's Republic of China uh, and the African Union member states. Uh, China is reported now uh, to be the largest trading partner with the 54 independent states on the continent. Now, since 1949, uh, the, when the Socialist Revolution uh, consolidated in China, the country uh, has made tremendous strides uh, in economic development as well as political status. Uh, there's no way the imperialists or uh, minor uh, partners uh, in regard to imperialism or any uh, geopolitical uh, block of nations or regions throughout the world can ignore China in regard to foreign policy. Just this weekend, uh, there's a meeting that's taking place in California uh, between the new uh, premier of China and the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, and of course, just last week, uh, Secretary of State Hegel was accusing China of uh, being involved in cyber uh, warfare against the United States. And this week, they're sitting down and having a discussion with them. And now, in, t in today's New York Times, they were accusing Iran of being involved in cyber attacks against the United States. So it's very interesting to observe. Very interesting. In just six and a half decades, uh, China has grown into the second largest economic power globally. Uh, Beijing's opinions and political alliances are always taken into consideration by various imperialist states, as well as developing countries in the so-called global south. Now, in 2000, uh, the Forum on Africa-China Cooperation, uh, FOCAC, was formed. Uh, over the last 13 years, some five summits of the organization uh, have been held with, the, with uh, concrete results that have been uh, beneficial to both China as well as uh, states on the African continent. Uh, China is still, you know, in my opinion, a socialist state, despite the adoption of uh, capitalist methods of production and trade. The government is controlled uh, by the Communist Party, and central planning of the economy provides the country with an advantage uh, that is lacking within Europe and North America Whereas the anarchy of capitalist production has driven down living standards, as Fred talked about, of working people, and it's rendered hundreds of millions of people to unemployment, uh, to poverty, to social insecurity, and escalating political repression just over the last uh, half decade. This is what the dominant uh, political and economic situation is in the capitalist states. Now, this phenomenon of central planning is a key factor in its attractiveness uh, to African as well as Latin American states, because um, China has been escalating uh, their relations with Latin America. Venezuela, uh, they signed an economic agreement a few years ago uh, between you know the uh, late uh, President Hugo Chavez and uh, the leadership in China, some $4 billion in terms of uh, oil uh, resources uh, coming out of uh, Venezuela. Uh, this, of course, uh, gives it advantage, the central planning uh, in China. Projects between China and Africa have resulted in the advent of agricultural, industrial, medical, as well as educational projects. Now, I wrote an article uh, that was published in Workers' World, and this is a collection of uh, articles uh, out of Workers' World uh, that were published uh, two years ago um, entitled African Imperialism. And one of the articles in this collection uh, is entitled Africa Increases Trade with China and Others. And it's said that a major impediment to economic development in Africa and other former colonial territories in the world has been the legacy of imperialism and its stronghold uh, on the productive forces within these states. You know, they often say that uh, colonialism uh, helped to modernize Africa. Uh, but uh, the extent to which modernization took place, it only served the interests of colonialism and imperialism. Uh, the phenomena of neocolonialism uh, has hampered so-called third world countries from exercising their independence, neocolonialism being the new form of colonialism. Now, irrespective of the political and class character of the leadership within these developing states, unquote, 
Now, this same article goes on to say that, quote, in recent years, numerous African governments have sought to increase trade and economic cooperation with nations having similar histories of colonial domination. China, of course, uh, was, in, in essence, a former colony of Britain. Um, you know, of course, even now, Taiwan is heavily dominated uh, you know, by U.S. political imperatives. Hong Kong was just uh, released uh, from British control um, you know, a little over a decade ago, uh, and it rejoined uh, mainland China. Uh, these efforts have caused much consternation in the West, where imperialist states have sought to maintain influence over the political direction taken uh, by developing countries. Now, the second part, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about the history of Africa-China relations in the modern era, meaning since uh, World War II. Now, what is often overlooked by the corporate media and the functionaries of U.S. imperialism is that the relations between China and Africa blossomed during the period of the National Liberation Revolutions of the 1950s and 1960s. So this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, when you hear the State Department saying that this is perhaps something new, that China is making this major push into Africa, it's totally incorrect. China played a significant role at the Bandung Conference in Indonesia in 1955, which led to the formation of the Non-Aligned Movement, which was formed in 1960 and 1961, that encompassed like uh, Egypt under Abdel Nasser, Ghana under Kwame Nkrumah, um, you know, Yugoslavia under Tito. They were all part of this Non-Aligned Movement, which still exists today. Uh, Cuba uh, was uh, president of the Non-Aligned Movement up until about uh, three years ago. Uh, so it's still a force. Uh, Iran now is the chair of the Non-Aligned Movement. They had the Non-Aligned Summit in Tehran last summer. Now, China, under the Communist Party leadership of Mao Zedong and Chao Enlai, reached out to Africa by providing assistance and training to independence movements through political and military support that was critical in the struggles taking place in Ghana, uh, in Guinea, uh, Mozambique, uh, which was involved in the armed struggle during the 60s and 70s, and Zimbabwe, which was involved in the armed struggle during the 60s and 70s, as well as other areas of the continent. In 1963, China issued two statements in support of the civil rights movement of African Americans here in the United States, demanding full equality and an end to racism in the United States. This was at perhaps um, one of the high points of the civil rights movement in 1963. At the time of one of these statements in 1963, Mao Zedong was accompanied by leading figures in the national liberation movements on the African continent. At this same time, the mass struggles of African Americans were reaching their heights, with thousands of people being jailed in 1963. Many people were beaten. Medgar Evers, we're going to com commemorate tomorrow the 50th anniversary of his brutal assassination in 1963. For their efforts, in, in terms of the African-American people and their allies that were aimed at in ending legalized segregation. We're talking about 50 years ago. Um, we had legalized segregation in the United States, you know, in the North as well as the South. You know, it wasn't just confined uh, to uh, the South. I live in Detroit now. I was born in the South. And um, I, I, can, I'm old, I was a child, but I'm old enough to remember the white-only signs, you know, the colored entrances at restaurants, uh, all of that. You know, my parents were involved in the civil rights movement uh, in the mid-60s and so forth. So this is not a long, long time ago that you had legalized, you know, racial segregation in the United States. In 1964, uh, Chao Enlai, uh, who was the premier at the time of China, visited several African states. When the Communist Party leader and premier of the People's Republic of China stopped in Ghana, that was then under the leadership of uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who was a revolutionary uh, Pan-Africanists and a socialist. Chow and Lai stated that, quote, Africa was ripe for revolution, unquote. This was in 1964. China granted political asylum even to African-American revolutionaries during the 1960s. Robert F. Williams, uh, who was from uh, Monroe, North Carolina, and who settled in Michigan, spent many years in China uh, during that time period. He was driven out of the United States uh, by the Southern racists who were backed up by the FBI. They put hundreds of FBI agents on his case, chased him out of the country to Canada, and he eventually went to Cuba, spent time in Cuba, and then eventually went to the People's Republic of China. Williams was instrumental 
and Mao issuing these statements of solidarity in 1963 and later efforts in 1968 in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Now, after the assassination of Dr. King in 1968, uh, there were rebellions in 125 cities across the United States. And uh, um, Mao Zedong issued another statement in solidarity um, saying that China would stand with the African American people in their struggle for freedom and that these rebellions and other struggles in the United States should seek the elimination of capitalism and imperialism throughout the world. Other African American leaders would be uh, hosted by China during this period. Okay, uh, including um, Stokely Carmichael, who was chair of SNCC, visited China. Even before that, W.B. Du Bois and Shirley Graham Du Bois uh, would, were hosted by China. Then later, Elaine Brown who was, and Huey P. Newton, who were leaders of the Black Panther Party, were also hosted by China. Even as late as 1992, when African Americans and Latinos rose up in rebellion in response to the Rodney King beatings and the ferry of an all-white jury to convict cops on criminal charges, China also released a statement of solidarity with the rebellions, which started in LA but extended to 28 cities around the country. Now, with specific reference to Africa, a report was issued by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, in 2010, and it noted that, quote, the trade between Africa and China had increased by 1,000 percent between 2000 and 2008. Today, and this was written in 2010, China accounts for 11 percent of the continent's external trade, with the bulk of transactions taking place in the sectors of primary products, including fuels and minerals. In the same above-mentioned article, the writer says, in contrast to the legacy of trade between Africa and Western imperialism, trade with China has been important in fostering economic and social development. UNCTAD economist Javier Ziza refuted allegations by Western media sources that China increasing role, China's increasing role in Africa is not benefiting the continent, unquote. Ziza said, and I quote again, the challenge is for Africa to find ways to harness and manage this relationship for better development outcomes. He also uh, does not perceive China's growing relations with Africa as a new form of colonialism, arguing that this emerging economic cooperation was based on the principles of, quote, mutual respect, reciprocal benefits, respect for sovereignty, and non-interference in the internal affairs of the continent. Two African states have been targeted by the imperialists for regime change, Zimbabwe as well as Sudan. And they have both been supported and defended by China within the UN Security Council. Uh, they blocked efforts uh, to impose even more draconian sanctions against these two African states. And they played an instrumental role in preventing the economic collapse of Zimbabwe, uh, which uh, was under aggressive economic sanctions uh, because of the ZANU PF government and engaged in a land redistribution program in 2000. Early in 2013, just this year, the first major foreign policy conference attended by the new Chinese president and general secretary of the Communist Party, uh, Xi Jinping, was the BRICS summit, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa summit that was held, and it was attended by over 4,000 people in the Republic of South Africa in Durban. Xi um, then visited other African states where he pledged to continue China's long-term relations with the AU and AU member states. Now, in concluding, I would just like to point out that as anti-imperialists uh, and as socialists, uh, even if we don't totally agree you know, with the political and economic process that's going on in China, we have to work to refute you know, this, these imperialist attacks and propaganda against China as a means of our solidarity with Africa. Because Africa has a right, just like any other former uh, colonized and oppressed region of the world, to choose their own economic partners, their own political relationships, and um, it should be defended, you know, by the anti-war and anti-imperialist movement in this country. Now, with the development of China and Africa relations in the most recent period, the U.S. and its agents are attempting to distort the character of these joint projects. Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton visited Africa just last summer and stated indirectly that China represented a colonial threat to the continent. Really? Such a statement represents the absurdity of Washington's approach to foreign policy. The U.S., which is a leading threat to Africa and the peoples of the world, has never supported any genuine liberation movement or progressive government in Africa, and therefore has no moral basis for any criticism or condemnation of China's role on the continent. 
The recent wave of militarism on the continent, in part, is based on the efforts of the U.S. imperialism to stifle and reverse China's partnership with the continent. These military threats and campaigns by the U.S. are also being replicated in Asia and the South Pacific as well. And Fred talked about that, and I'm sure Deirdre will talk about it even more with the deployment of U.S. warships in the region, uh, deploying uh, U.S. troops in Australia, the deployment of U.S. naval forces in the South China Sea, the escalation of hostilities against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and the dispatching of military troops to Australia are all aimed at attempts to, quote, contain China, unquote. The provocative claims of the Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, just last week, charging China with cyber espionage against the U.S. is following the same hostile line of confrontation against Beijing. Finally, anti-imperialist and anti-war forces inside the U.S. must defend China against these unwarranted claims and provocations. Genuine left organizations inside this country and other imperialist states must push for a principal stand by progressive forces towards China inside uh, North America. Thank you so much. And uh, if people want to get any comments, to touch on a couple of other questions that were raised. Um, you know, I once saw a documentary, uh, which goes back to Naomi's uh, question, about sweatshops around the world. They showed... Uh, Bangladesh, uh, they showed um, El Salvador, Guatemala, and they also showed uh, China. And, um, you know, not endorsing, you know, the production methods they were using there, but the conditions that the workers were living in, the way they were dressed, the, you know, their sleeping conditions and so forth, their relationship with their family looked, you know, far better, you know, in China than they did in comparison uh, to other uh, geopolitical regions. And, um, also, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, the defense industry in the United States is a probably a trillion dollar a year uh, project. Uh, if you count the $700 billion annual defense budget and combine that with the Homeland Security budget, which we don't even know what the budget actual figures are because a lot of it is undisclosed. The National Security Agency, they don't release their budget. The CIA doesn't either. We're talking about an SX of a trillion dollars annually that's being spent on defense and homeland security. You know, this is unsustainable. And we see clearly how it's impacting uh, the conditions, social conditions in the rural areas of this country, in the cities of this country, the small towns. Um, it has been devastating. You know, this is why uh, they're cutting back on public transport funding. They're closing schools, you know, by the hundreds uh, in individual cities. Uh, throughout the United States. We've got massive unemployment that's hidden, you know, uh, through these unemployment figures that came out, you know, just 7.6% the other day. But if you read below the headlines, you see that we have the lowest participation in the labor market in the United States in decades. Uh, people who are not even counted in the unemployment rolls. As Monica mentioned, un uh, poverty is rising in the United States, even among people who are in the so-called professional sectors of the economy. So yes, it's totally unsustainable, not to even mention the bailout of the banks, uh, direct bailouts and indirect bailouts through the housing industry, uh, through you know the crisis of municipal finance and so forth. 